Welcome to College Algebra. So today is what, the 30th? Which means November is almost gone. Okay, so we last time had briefly talked about exponentials. And so now we're going to continue our talk about exponentials. So, um, <clears throat> The first thing to say is that let's consider one other exponential. We considered one uh, yesterday. We plotted some points. Now let's consider this exponential. f of x is, say, half to x. So last time we considered the exponential that was 2 to x. So let's, um, let's plot some points here for this. Let's make a table of values. So how about x, f of x. So what if you plug in 0? You get 1. Because half to exponent 0 is 1. What if you plug in 1, which is to say half to 1? You have. Okay. What if you plug in two? One fourth, because that's half squared, so half times half, which is a fourth. Okay. How about what if you plug in three? One eighth. So, in particular, the way it's going to go is supposing that I keep incrementing x by one then this value is always the previous value times half. Okay, so then this is a fourth, half of that is an eighth. And then a sixteenth, etc. So it would continue doing that, but now I'm going to stop incrementing this and I'm going to write negative one now. So what is half to negative one? It's two. So let's see why that's the case. So half to negative 1. Well, so suppose we wanted to write this, this expression with a positive exponent. With a positive exponent. How do you write this with a positive exponent? Well, yes. You could, I'll do it in two steps. So you could say, well, this is 1 over half to 1. So putting it in the denominator does that. And then now I could, you know, say that this is 1 over a half. And then dividing by a fraction is the same as what? Multiplying by its reciprocal. So this is 1 times 2 over 1, which is 2. Okay, so that's sort of a long-winded way to say something that we knew from the beginning of the semester, which is that a over b to negative n is b over a to positive n. That when you reciprocate the thing inside, it negates the exponent. OK, so how about, how about uh, negative 2? What is 1 half to negative 2? 4, right? It's 4. What's 1 half to negative 3? Eight. 8. So now what will happen is if I continue, if I continue going down, incrementing this by negative 1, you'll get the next one by multiplying the previous one by 2. So what would the next one be? 16. 16. Okay, so now let's plot these values. Okay, so in the first place, in the first place, when you plug in zero, what do you get? One. So we get this point right here. When you plug in zero, you get one. And then, at least as we as we started, every time you move to the right, it's the previous height times half. Every time you move to the right. 
by one. So that would be like here, and then here, and then here. Every time you move to the right, you have, you have to hunt. So something like this. Okay, and every time you move to the left, what do you do? <coughs> you, do you double the height, right? So, you know, like, so I'm just eyeballing it. That's not a flat line. It should maybe look a little more curvy, but it's not flat. It goes, it goes up <coughs> quickly. Yeah, so this one should be way up here. What am I saying? And I drew it in pen, too. So this one would be, like, way up here. This much, that much. Okay, so now, uh, can anyone think of anything that actually does this? If you've taken a science class, if you, uh, say a chemistry class or a physics class, you actually know of something. Half-life. Half-life. Yeah, Half-life of something. So, for example, for example, uh, in nature, there is a type of atom called uranium. Okay, and uranium has atomic number of what? 92. 92. Okay, that means that it has 92 protons in it. And different, different, uh, different atoms, especially atoms with large-ish number of protons, can have different numbers of neutrons in it, in the nucleus. So there's a particular variety, isotope, of uranium uh, called uranium-235. And that means that it has nine, this is an atom that has 92 protons and also however many more neutrons it takes for the, that number to be 235. So it's got like 100 and something or other neutrons in it. And uranium-235 is interesting in human affairs because that's what we use to make nuclear weapons, among other things. Okay, but the reason why it's used to make nuclear weapons is because it's quite unstable. It's quite unstable. If you get enough uranium-235 together, and if you get it together, if you get enough of it together fast enough, then that's a, that will create a nuclear explosion. Okay. So, but we're not interested in that today. So what we're interested in today is that, well, uranium-235, part of its instability is that it actually transforms into other elements with a certain probability. So that is to say that a uranium-235 atom will eventually decay into other decay products ending in lead. Okay, so if we had a kilogram of U-235 right here, in the first place, that would be incredibly unsafe. But let's, let's, <laughs> let's forget that for a moment. Okay, if somehow we had a, a kilogram of uranium. And if we could watch, if we could monitor that kilogram of uranium-235, it has to be uranium-235. If we could monitor it for about 93,000 years, then we would observe that we still have a kilogram of material, but only half of that kilogram is uranium-235. The other half has turned into something else. So we, at the end of 93,000 years, we just have half a kilogram. And then if we were to wait another 93,000 years, then we would have half of half of a kilogram. We'd have a quarter of a kilogram. And if we were to rate, wait even another 93,000 years, then we would have half of half of half of a kilogram. We have an eighth of a kilogram. So if this, is, if this represents one kilogram of uranium-235, then these, these intervals represent periods of 93,000 years. So after 93,000 years, we have half. After another 93,000, half of half. After another 93,000, half of half of half, etc. 
And this is a very good approximation as long as, as, long as the number of uranium-235 atoms is a lot, like, you know, on the order of a kilogram. When you start getting less than, much, much less than that, say just a few tens of millions of atoms, then it's not accurate anymore. Okay. Good. This is also how carbon dating works. Yes, it's exactly the same way. Is that, is that due to, <coughs> due to processes that, that living organisms go through, carbon can be irradiated to make carbon-14, which is an isotope, isotope of carbon, and it decays with half-life 5,370 or 5,370 years. Okay. Terrific. But now, I'd like to point out that I said that it's, it's only accurate when the number of such atoms is, is a, when you have a lot of such atoms. It's only statistically accurate. When you start getting down to a few number of atoms, it's not accurate anymore. Okay, so in fact, in fact, exponential functions are, in a very real sense, purely a mathematical and abstract thing. There is no, nothing that's actually exponential in real life. Okay, there can't be an exponential process in real life. It is, it is not possible. If there was an exponential process in real life, then there could not, then the universe couldn't exist as we know it. Okay, the reason is, <clears throat> to to give a sort of stark reason why this has to be the case, is let's go through the following thought experiment. Let's suppose that you, you uh, have an apartment that I'm really, really interested in renting. I would really like to rent it for you. And I offer you the two following things. I'll say, okay, I would be happy to rent the apartment from you for $10 million a week for the next 52 weeks. Or on the first week, I'll give you one penny. And the second week, I'll give you two pennies. And the third week, I'll give you four pennies. And each week, I'll, I'll double the number of pennies that I gave you the previous week. So like on the third week, on, on, the, on the fourth week, I'll give you eight pennies. Okay. So would you rather me do, do the pennies thing or the, or the $10 million a week thing? $10 million because with pennies, currency ceases to have value. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, if, if we were to do the, the 10 million thing, then after 52 weeks, that's $5.2 billion. I really like this apartment. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> let's do the let's do the thing. See, that's a lot of money, but it's not the Earth's supply of money. Yeah, right. Therefore, so on the first week I'd give you one penny. On the second week I'd give you two pennies. On the third week I'd give you four pennies. On the fourth week eight pennies. On the fifth week. Uh, 16 pennies, etc. So every every week I give you twice the number of pennies. So rather than enumerate them all out to 52, let's try and see the pattern. So how do I get if this is if this is x week x, then what is this? Well, what's the formula in terms of x? It's got to have, it's got to be base 2, right? Because it is exponential. So 2 to what? Is it 2 to x? Well, let's think about that for a moment. Is, is 1 2 to 1? No. No, what is 1? 2 to 0. So it's 2 to x minus 1. Right, 2 to exponent x minus 1. Which is to say that, for example, 16, that's 2 to 5 minus 1. Right? Okay. So let's skip a few and let's go down to say like the 30th week. On the 30th week, so how many pennies would that be in, in, when, you rep, when you write it as base 2? Two? 2 to what? 2 to 29. 2 to 29. Okay. So 2 to 29, if we write that with the calculator, because I actually don't know 2 to 29 off the top of my head. That would be 
remember this is pennies now. Five, three, six, eight, seven, zero, nine, one, two. So this is pennies. So now I'm going to write the notation to help <coughs> us understand what that is in dollars. So decimal point and then comma and then comma. Okay, so that's 5.36 million, 5.37 million. So I'd give you, you know, on the 30th week, I'm just now paying you 5 million. And if, if, we, if you had taken the other deal, already at this point, you'd have $3 billion. All right? So, or would it be 300 million? 30? No, it'd be 3 billion. Yeah. It'd be a lot. <laughs> okay. So, okay. On the 30th week, I finally pay you half as much as I'd be paying you every week to date. So do you still want to go with this? I'd still be happy. <laughs> You'd be happy either way. <laughs> you make do. Yeah, I, th I think so. Okay, well, let's jump to the end then. So at week 52, the last payment, then what is the number of pennies? Two to 51. Two to 51. Okay, well, let's type that into the machine. 2 to 51. Okay. So my, num my calculator is giving me a number in scientific notation. So it's gi this is the number it's giving me. 2 to 517, 998,14. Uh, and that's all the digits it's giving me. And it's saying that there's a decimal point here and it's times 10 to the 15 which means that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So I'm, we're just going to round all those down to zero. Okay, I don't know what these are. But let's count how much this is in dollars. So there's the decimal point for because we're dealing with pennies. So then comma, 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 comma. Okay. So that's Hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions. Okay, so the last payment is 22 and a half trillion. And if you were to add up all of the previous payments, right, because that's the payment in week 52. The payment in week 51 was 11 trillion. Yeah. So if we were to add up all the prior payments, these would also add up to about 22 trillion. So the total payment for the, week, for the, for the year, supposing that I gave you one penny the first week, and two pennies the second week, et cetera. The total payment over the course of the year would be $45 trillion. The, the, the gross world product, that is to say how much, how much wealth is generated by the entire planet every year is, is on the order of $60 trillion. So this is, this is on the order of, I'll, I will pay you the entire output of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> This for this apartment. <laughs> it's a great apartment. <laughs> it gets great reviews. Okay, th so what I want to point out is that, is that, okay, now, if this were to continue for another year or so, if this were to continue for another year, and maybe not, I, I don't know it off the top of my head, so it's either, either one year or another year after this, then, then I would be giving you enough pennies to where I would have given you like a penny for every proton in the universe. In the universe, I give you one penny for every proton. Okay. There can be no process that is exponential in the universe because consider this seemingly sort of, it doesn't seem like a big deal at the beginning, right? But if we were to continue this process for much longer, then it would, it would engulf the entire universe. Okay, similarly, this, stories like this, a different apocryphal version of this story is, is back in the day, there was a, there was a peasant who lived in, in a kingdom, and this peasant saved the king's life. And the king said, okay, well, I'm so grateful for that. <laughs> and and I, I want to repay you somehow. And the peasant was in the king's court and saw a chessboard and said, okay, king, uh, mainly what I want is just food for my family. So, so I want you to give me one grain of rice on the first chess square and two grains of rice on the second chess square and then four and then eight 
right? Double it every time. And the king said, yeah, of course, yeah, we'll do it. No problem. Okay, but then when you actually calculate it, right, the last, how many squares are on a chessboard? 64, right? We went to 52 here. Okay, so then 2 to 63 on the, on the last one, right? 2 to 63 grains, grains of rice. That's like on the order of the mass of the earth. It's a lot. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> be, be, so the hereditary principle has been shown to be not accurate. So being king doesn't actually confer any intelligence whatsoever. And, and nor does being a peasant deny you intelligence either. Okay, good. <clears throat> so there is nothing exponential. So I just, when you see like on news media or on Twitter, when someone says this is exponentially greater or whatever, no. <laughs> Sorry. Now I'll, I, <laughs> I'll allow for the different contexts. Language means different things. So exponential, understand that when you hear that in the wild, right, not in, not in math class, exponential is a synonym for bigger or big or something. But, it, but it's not exponential. Oh, this is exponentially greater. No, sorry. <laughs> it's not. <clears throat> okay. Good. So now, uh, remarks about the shape. of exponentials. So two remarks that we need to know. <clears throat> so every exponential, one way to break their um, shapes down into groups is like this. So suppose that we're considering the exponential uh, b to x. Well, one possibility is that the base is between 0 and 1. And the other possibility is that the base is greater than 1. So an example of this would be something like half to x, because half is between 0 and 1. And an example of this would be something like 2 to x, because 2 is greater than 1. So now let's consider for a moment. What is half to zero? One. So it's going to go through that point. And what is two to zero? Also one. So it also will go through this point. So now this one, as you move to the right, every time you move one position to the right, you half your height. So one position to the right, you'd be at height half and then height quarter, and then height an eighth, and then height a sixteenth, etc. Whereas for this one, every time you move to the right, what, what happens to your height? You double your height. So presently you're at one, next you'll be at two, and then four, and then eight, etc. So this one will look like this. It increases to the right. This one will be its mirror reflection. <clears throat> so this is called exponential growth, and this one exponential decay. Another historical fallacy that has occurred concerning exponentials is by a famous, now famous person called Thomas Malthus. So you may have heard of something called a Malthusian catastrophe. And it's the observation that, that life, that is to say organisms, among humans among them, 
their, the population of organisms grows in proportion to the current size of the population, which is to say, for example, human beings are currently growing like, well, let's just say this. Uh, in the United States, human beings are currently increasing in their numbers by about 2.1% per year, which is to say that if there was 100 people this year, we can expect there to be 102.1 people next year okay, in the United States. So if there's 300 million people in the United States, that's approximately how many there are, then we can expect there to be 102.1% of that next year. So there'd be like 300 and, you know, whatever that number is. It would be 300 times 1.02. So 306 million people next year. So the United States would grow 6 million people. Okay, and that's, that's at first blush, that seems kind of scary because notice with the pennies how fast that grows. So if, if we're growing in proportion to our current size, then does that mean that we're all going to be elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder in a couple of years? That's what Thomas Malthus thought. Okay, and of course that's ridiculous. That's not what actually happens. If that actually happened, right, you hear things like rabbits reproduce so quickly. Well, if that was, if rabbits reproduced exponentially, then we'd be overcome with rabbits. Even now they'd be busting in the door. But that's not what happens. Okay, because you only, you, you, you're gro you grow in proportion not only to your current size, but also according to what resources you presently have. Okay. <clears throat> Good. So the next shape consideration is the following. So now, every exponential will go through this point. So that is to say the exponential of 0 is 1 for all exponentials. So now I'm going to draw base 2. So this is 2 to x, uh, 2 to x. Okay. So if that's 2 to x, then let's consider 3 to x for a moment. So what's, for example, 2 to 4? 16. And what if we change the base from 2 to 3? Then what's 3 to 4? 81. Which means that by the time you get over to 4, this one has made it to 16. But if it was base 3 by the time you get over to 4, you've made it all the way to 81. <laughs> And if it was in base 10, 10 to x, well, what's 10 to 4? Is it? Yeah, 10,000. So if it was base 10, by the time you got over to position 4, you'd be at height 10,000. Okay. So if we're dealing with 3 to x, then 3 to x also grows, but it grows way quick in comparison to 2 to x. So 3 to x would be like this. Be able, it shoots up a lot faster. Uh, let's consider going to the left. So now, what is, what is 2 to negative 1? It would be half. It'd be half. What is 3 to negative 1? A third. Which of these is, is the smaller? Third. A third. So that means that as I draw this blue going to the left, instead of being, instead of being uh, over, like I am on the right, I need to be under on the left. Okay. So now, I'm going to mention a number. So there's a number that's important. I'm just, right now I'm just by fiat saying it's important. And I'll explain why it's important later. But there's a number that is important, and it is called E, the natural number, and it's approximately 2.71. And notably, I'd like for you to observe that 2.71 is in between 2 and 3. 
So if I was to plot exponential e to x, then where would it be with respect to these? It'd be intermediate. Because, because 2.71 is bigger than 2, it, in here it'd have to be over 2 to x, but it, because it's less than 3, it'd have to be under 3 to x. Similarly over here. However, at this point, they're all going through the same point. So e, 2.71-ish, to 0 is still 1. So e to x would look something like this. Now I drew it closer to the blue purposefully. Why do you suppose I did that? Right, because 2.71 is closer to 3 than it is to 2. Okay, so these are basically all the shape considerations that you need to know. Is that if the base is between 0 and 1, it decays. If it's greater than 1, it's growth. And, and intermediate bases are drawn intermediately. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, so now, now we're going to talk about money. So in particular, we're going to talk about interest. So one of the things that I would really like for you to understand by the time you leave college algebra is what interest is. So now, many of you know that interest exists and know more or less what it means, but you're not aware of why it exists in the first place. Okay. So what is interest? Let's say the following. Let's say you have a big mountain of money. And then I come to you and say, you know what? I have this thing that I want to do right now. And I need $10,000 to do it. And I see that you have $10,000. So I'd like to use your $10,000, your $10,000 to do it. So we could enter into the following agreement. You could say, OK, OK, I'll give you exclusive access to this $10,000 for a year, and I can't use it, I can't demand it of you, you it's, it's yours. But at the end of the year, I want it back. And I reckon that's, that's inconvenient for me because that means that if during the course of the year I wanted it, I couldn't have it. And it's convenient to you because whatever it is that you want to do, you can't do it without it. So let's put a number on how convenient that is, how inconvenient it is to me and how convenient it is to you. Let's put a number on it. That number is called interest. So we might say, okay, you have the 10,000 and I want to use it. So, okay, let's agree that after one year I'm going to give you back the 10,000 and also I'll give you back $300. Because maybe that's how much we reckon the convenience is to me and the inconvenience to you. That's what interest is. It, it is you know, a common phrase is the time value of money. It's convenient for me to have exclusive access to that $10,000 for the period of one year. And it's inconvenient for you to lose access to it. And we're going to put a number on that, and that number is called interest. Okay. So, for example, our remark. Uh, suppose we have a principal deposit. P uh, at interest rate R. Determine the amount A after one period. So this is something like the following. It would be like saying, okay, you're going to loan me $10,000 for one year, and at the end of one year, I'm going to give you back the $10,000, and also I'm going to give you, say, 3%. Okay. <clears throat> so that would be A, the amount paid back, is the principal, plus 
the principal multiplied by the interest rate. So I'll give you back what you loaned, and I'll also give you back that much more. So notice that there's a common factor of P. What would you get if you factored out P? So, which is to say, if I was to factor out that P, what do I need to put in there? 1 plus R. Okay. So this is a formula. This is called the simple interest formula. It does not represent the way things happen in, the, in real life. But let's do one quick example problem. So for example, let's write down that, that example that I've been saying out loud. Suppose that, that you loan me uh, $10,000 and that I say, and that we come to an agreement saying that that's worth 3%. So the interest rate, you have to write the interest rate as a decimal. So what is 3% written as a decimal? 0.03. That would mean that at the end of one year, I'd give you back the 10,000, and also I would give you back 3% of 10,000. So that would mean that A is P times 1 plus R. which in this specific case would be saying that that's uh, 10,000 multiplied by 1.03, which is 10300. So in the language of convenience and, and exclusive access, what, what we would have agreed to is to say, well, I agree that you having exclusive access to that $10,000 is worth $300 to me for a year. Okay? So, <clears throat> now, in real life, this is not the way it works at all. So, for example, uh, if you have a bank account at, and it's a savings account, then, they, then the bank might say, well, this is a 3% interest savings account. What that means is that you're, you're getting paid interest to hold money in, in your for the bank to hold money in your bank account. And um, the way the bank actually reckons it is they reckon it once per month. So let's say, for example, if you had a 24% interest rate savings account, <laughs> that would be terrific. If you have that, just leave. Just, just go put all your money in there and just don't come back. Okay? So... <laughs> But for the purposes of numbers, let's say that that's the case. So if you had a 24% interest account, then the bank would reckon interest on it monthly, and you'd get 1 12th of 24%. What it, so that is to say 24 over 12, which is 2%. So if you had a 2% annual account, uh, sorry, a 24% annual account, what that actually means is that a 2% interest would be reckoned every month. Okay? More realistically is something like you have a, a 2.1 interest uh, savings account and then 2.1% 2, 2 divided by 12 is how much is reckoned per month. Okay, and the number 24 sounds totally unreasonable until you realize that credit card debt is almost uniformly reckoned between 16 and 24%. So if you have a 24% <laughs> credit card, then every month, 2% is reckoned against you. And that's no joke. And that's scary. <laughs> but you won't ever... It's, it's not exponential, because eventually you'll just go bankrupt. <laughs> okay, good. <clears throat> so, any question about, about this? So let's see how, how interest is, is reckoned um, in real life. So, so this is called the compound interest formula. OK. 
Okay, there are five parameters in this model. So we have A is the current amount or the current account balance. P is the principal deposit. What this means is that is the is the current account balance at time zero. Uh, R is the periodic interest rate. In real life, periodic is essentially always annual in real life. N is the number of periods, uh, sorry, number of uh, compoundings. per period in real life if you're doing monthly compoundings this means that n is 12 and t this is the number of periods. So in real life, that means the number of years. Okay, the model that relates all of these is A is P multiplied by 1 plus R divided by N to NT. Okay. So, okay. This is a model that you need to memorize. But you should understand that the way it's going to work. So you need to know what all of these what all of these variables mean. But in the end, this is a five-parameter model, which means that when I give you a question, I'm going to give you four of them. Okay, and I want you to find the last one. So somehow I give you all but one. Okay, in ev in, ev in every story. So for example. <coughs> <laughs> These people are just so, authors are so uncreative. Why do they do this? Okay, let's not do that. <clears throat> let's do it like this. So, for example, let's, let's imagine it in the following way. Let's say that um, <clears throat> you've got a rich relative and that on the day of your birth, on the day of your birth, the, uh, the relative made a single deposit into an account, uh, and they wanted you to have, say, $100,000 on the day that you entered into university. And let's say that you entered into university exactly on your 19th birthday, or 20th, let's make it 20, so it's, the numbers are slightly nicer. So you enter university on the, d on the day of your 20th birthday, and uh, the question is, is how much did your, did your uh, wealthy relative need to deposit on the day of your birth so that the amount of money that you had in the account was exactly $100,000 on the day you entered university? Okay? So let's say that you want $100,000 uh, at 20 years uh, 
and suppose that you have an account with a monthly interest rate, uh, sorry, an annual interest rate compounded monthly annual interest rate of, say, 8.7% compounded monthly, monthly. So how much do you need to deposit? Zero. You might think 8.7% is, ki is kind of high, but it's actually not. And the reason why 8.7% is, is, is totally reasonable is because what you're saying is, okay, I'm going to give the bank exclusive access to this money for 20 years, and I can't have it. Well, the bank reckons that is pretty valuable. So 8.7% 8 is actually reasonable for for such a long period of, of exclusive access. Okay, so then what variables do we need and what variables do we, do, we need, do we need to find out? So A, do we know this or do we need to find this? We need to find this, right? Because A is the current account balance. We want the current account balance at 20 years. So that's what we need to find. Oh no, we don't need to find that. No, we have that. <laughs> we have this. What is this? 100,000, right? This is 100,000. Yeah, so P, this is what we need to find, which is to say that how much money, how much money right now is worth 100,000 in the future? Okay, how about R? Do we know R? 0.08. 0 0.08. Because the interest rate is 8.7%. And then reckoned as a decimal, that's 0 0.087. So what's N? It's 12, the number of compoundings per month. And then what's T? 20. Do you notice that we have a five-parameter model, and I've given you four of them? Okay, so then now it's just a matter of plugging things in, so let's do this quickly. So we know that 100,000 is P multiplied by 1 plus 0 0.087 divided by 12 raised to 12 times 20. So that we could solve for P, P is 100,000 divided by 1 plus 0 0.087 over 12, and I'll do that in my head. What is that? 240. And so now, I'll do it, but for your own sake, please make sure that you can get a calculator to do this. Okay? So I'll do it real quick. Divided by... So my calculator is saying that the answer is 17662.56. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. On the day of your birth, a deposit of $17,662.56 will result in a, in a current account balance of $100,000. 20 years in the future. Banks yes. At 8 .7 yeah, this is called a CD, but no one has seventeen thousand dollars to, to put down right now. <laughs> all right. I, I I had like like three three uh, nephews born recently. <laughs> I didn't have seventeen thousand dollars for them either. <laughs> okay. 